All right, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I will talk about the cell phone networks, plural, that we've been running here at the conference. So, brief introduction, uh, I'll talk about the process of setting up this te test network, so the steps that are needed in order to, to make this happen. I will talk about some, some technical stuff, what we actually have been running here. I will compare this with some of the previous installations that we've done at CCC events over the last few years. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the challenges that we've faced. Actually, even though we're moving, uh, we've moved to a new location, this turned out to be uh, very manageable to, uh, to set up. I promise to show some statistics and I'll try to make some concluding remarks. My name is Peter. I moved from Sweden to Berlin a couple of years ago. I like to do uh, software, hardware, security things, electronics, open source. You may know me from presenting uh, various other projects here or elsewhere. I've been involved in running the GSM networks at um, the CCC camp last year, uh, C3 last year. I went to Burning Man and helped run the GSM network there this year, and finally here in, in Hamburg. So the process for setting up this test network. Uh, we, need to, we need to take a look at the area to, that we want to provide coverage to, to see, well, how many base stations do we need? Uh, where can we put them? Where is there good connectivity? Where is there power that we need to run them? Uh, we need to consider what kind of uh, signal propagation there is. So if it's inside a building, if it's outdoors, are there trees in the way? Are there large buildings in the way? Or indoors, are there walls in the way? Any, any kind of metal surface is really good at causing problems for, for any radio communication. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind if uh, we have a, a metal box or a room with metal walls or reinforced concrete, then that is going to shield very uh, effectively any radio signal that we have outside or inside. So uh, yes, keeping that in mind is important. We make a plan for cell site deployment, so sort of a rough idea of what we want to put where in order to make this work. And it's a good idea to make a backup plan also, because even though if we go to the uh, uh, area, if, even if we have the ability to go to the area, it might, uh, we might not be able to make all tests right up front, and we may discover that hmm, actually the things we, we plan to do, that didn't really work out. Uh, we are operating in Germany, so we also need to send a uh, request for a test license to the Bundesnetzagentur in order to be allowed to actually run this network because we are transmitting radio, radio signals. So this is, uh, this is important. And uh, we sent that in, I think in September, maybe possibly October. And uh, yeah, then we wait. And we wait some more. And then when it starts getting mid-December, we get a bit nervous because we haven't heard anything back. But um, yeah, the, the license uh, arrived just in time, and uh, everyone is, is really happy. So meanwhile, we can, of course, continue and configure the stuff that we're going to run here. We configure the, the hardware, and uh, we think about things like, where do we mount uh, the, the equipment that we want to deploy? How do we mount it securely so that it doesn't fall down and hurt anyone, so that it doesn't disappear? Uh, we configure software now. Since we've been doing this for a few uh, for a few different events already, we we have a setup that we uh, carry with us. And uh, as some of you may know, if you have a SIM card from any of the previous events, they continue to work because we carry the database along with us with uh, all the subscriber uh, information or, or well all the SIM card information. Uh, even so, we have to program new SIM cards as well, because not everyone has a SIM card, or uh, I talked to several people who, who did get SIM cards at a previous event, but they forgot them at home, or they didn't know that they would work again. Uh, and uh, of course, there are new visitors who also want to uh, use the network and help, uh, help test things out. So when we arrive on location, the next step is to 
to start doing some testing, uh, rig some kind of temporary base station in some of the locations that we have in mind and see how it works. That's, so there are, there are some models for mathematical models for calculating radio, uh, radio signal propagations, but uh, there's really nothing that beats empirical testing. So just setting something quick, setting something up very quickly and walking around with a cell phone and maybe a, uh, the Osmocom BB phones that have a, a special monitoring mode or a monitoring software that was developed uh, by the community and which is also open source. You've heard about that previously. Uh, using that as a measurement tool is, is very valuable. Or uh, there are a couple of other popular phones, the Nokia 3310, for example, uh, that are also very useful for, for monitoring networks. And yeah, when we, once we've sort of, I guess, iterated over our deployment plan, we, we simply deploy. We uh, uh, put out all the base stations and hook them up to, to power and, and backhaul. So I mentioned networks, and there are two logos here. Uh, we have actually been running uh, both OpenBSC and OpenBTS. Uh, not at the same time, well, for a brief, brief period at the same time, but uh, mostly separately uh, with a strong emphasis on OpenBSC. We didn't run OpenBTS for, for very long periods of time. Uh, we'll see that a bit later. It's, it's shown in the graphs. Um, some background on these projects in case you don't already know of them. BSC uh, stands for Base Station Controller. That's a, a, a standardized part of a traditional GSM network, all documented in the thousands of pages of specification. It's a part of the Osmocom open source uh, mobile communications family of projects. It is uh, a project that was started by uh, Harald Welte uh, in 2008, a couple of years ago. And what it does is we use standard BTS hardware, which is also used by uh, commercial networks and uh, have been around for a very long time. The actual radio hardware is, is a product that can be bought from, from the suppliers or from the manufacturers. Uh, but we replace the control software that is running normally on a separate uh, or always on a separate piece of hardware and controls these radio units. The radio units are BTS. Uh, are called BTS, and the BSC is, well, the base station controller. So it controls one or more of these units, and this control is replaced by, or is performed by OpenBSC, the, the open source software. Uh, OpenBSC follows a, a model of the traditional GSM networks. It, it likes to uh, use many of the standard protocols that uh, have been defined in the traditional GSM specifications. And, and it, it, it's structured and uh, implements much of um, uh, much of the uh, how traditional GSM networks work. OpenBTS, I also mentioned. So BTS is, is short for Base Transceiver Station, but uh, yeah, and, and OpenBTS open source project also uh, started by David Burgess and and Harman Samra in also in 2008. Uh, it takes a different approach. It implements a, a GSM, uh, it implements the GSM radio communication using software-defined radio. So uh, instead of using a factory or a, a product that was uh, bought from someone, it's a software-defined radio with, uh, which implements exactly the, the GSM radio communication. And what it does, the, the, the big difference, so the communication on the, on the, uh, on, over radio is identical between whatever way you do, otherwise it won't work at all with uh, mobile phones. It has to follow the standard. So both of these products, uh, or both of these software projects, they, they implement the correct GSM signaling. And uh, the big difference is really in the back end side, where OpenBSC, again, it follows the more traditional GSM network implementation or GSM met, uh, network model, whereas OpenBTS has a zip backend directly. So someone has said that OpenBTS is sort of the internet reaching out to mobile phones, whereas OpenBSC is more of a, an internet engineer um, sort of perspective on how 
GSM networks uh, traditionally work. So two, two different projects, they've been around for about as long. Uh, I've always um, thought that it would be really nice to somehow combine them, and I'm happy that we've uh, had the opportunity to work together here this year. So the OpenBSC installation is, is what I'll go into detail about uh, because I, I helped set that up. I didn't work with the other part. Uh, we had five BTSs set up in the CCH, uh, about one per floor, roughly. There's one on the ground floor hanging from the ceiling next to the elevators. There is um, uh, with an omnidirectional antenna, so it has a cover covers the, the most of the uh, ground floor, if not all of the ground floor. Uh, there's one on the first floor in our room. There's one on the second floor next to the elevators on the other side uh, in the foyer, foyer number two. On the third or fourth floor, there's uh, one here up on the balcony. And on the fourth floor in the far end of the building, there is um, uh, one installation on top of a fridge in, in the bar. Uh, and this setup, it, it brings us, um, with the nano BTS units, it, it brings us uh, moderate to really good coverage throughout all of this building. And actually, we were able to, to have some communication even uh, by the Damtor train station. So comparing this with previous events, at the CCC camp, uh, we, we were also using OpenBSC. Uh, we had, however, completely different hardware. We were using the, the Nokia Metro site um, BTS hardware, which uh, has uh, uh, an ISDN backhaul. So we needed to use ISDN, uh, an ISDN card in our, uh, in our uh, server, our server machine. And we had two sites at, at the camp. They were pretty far away. They were, uh, we had antenna towers mounted on two bunkers. Well, one antenna tower and one antenna mounted on top of the bunker. Uh, they were far away and we had to run an ISDN E1 cable between these two sides. So uh, that turned out to be over 180 meters of, of CAT5 cable, which exceeds the, actually the, the maximum length of ISDN cabling. But it, it, it worked reliably anyway, fortunately. Uh, 28C3, we uh, again using OpenBSC. That's uh, that's what we've been using the most here. Uh, also, many of the, the local people are uh, actively working on these projects. So, uh, on the OpenBSC project, so that tends to be what we know the best and what we what we work with. Uh, we had at uh, 28C3 in the BCC three sites, again one per floor. Uh, we were using the same kind of BTS hardware, but we had configured them to work uh, together. So they were deployed in pairs on each floor. There were two BTSs. Uh, TRX stands for transceiver. Uh, so in total, uh, six BTSs, actually more BTSs, but because they were deployed, uh, uh, connected together in the same spot, uh, while they allowed more channels, more uh, calls being active, they did not cover as, as large an area as we have been able to do here uh, in the CCH. And um, yes, of course, that was using also uh, a local area network backhaul, which is so incredibly convenient compared to the ISDN, uh, ISDN stuff. Especially with uh, technology like VLANs, you can uh, talk to the, the network guys and say, well, uh, we would like to to deploy our BTSs there and there and there, and magically you have a completely separated network on just a couple of different uh, uh, random ports throughout the building. So some challenges. Um, as I mentioned in the start, surprisingly few challenges. We, uh, we have found that it's, it's pretty easy for even for private individuals to request and to be assigned a test license. Uh, there's a, a, an administrative cost associated with this. You have to pay, uh, I think, on the order of 200 euros. Uh, you, can, you can apply for a license that uh, runs for one year. Then you have to pay a, a much smaller fee to renew this license. Uh, that's, that's how we found that it works. And um, as far as I know, none of the requests that have been made for 
uh, for test licenses have, have actually been declined. So uh, it seems that this is this is really something that is easy to test out, and um, we. Um, we learned that it's it's really helpful for the uh, Bundesnetzagentur tour to specify very clearly what it is we want to uh, what it is we want to actually test with this test license so um, be specific if you want to make an application be specific about the hardware that you want to use uh, about the software that you, you want to use and um, 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 yes that because that of course helps them uh, know what is going on and, and um, uh, perhaps uh, it also helps them make a, a quicker decision. So if you have a deadline or if you are doing this for an event where you need to, uh, uh, where you have access to users so that you can test your, uh, test your software or, well, our software maybe, the Osmocom software, then uh, keep in mind to request this, this test license in, in some good time because it's, uh, it's no fun to, uh, to not be able to run the network just because you haven't gotten a response yet. Uh, we, when we first visited the CCH here, we were uh, somewhat worried about the, the walls of the building. For instance, this, this is a really big room, and so the walls have to be strong. We uh, uh, were um, thinking that that might be a problem uh, if they were reinforced uh, metal, uh, had metal inside of them, that it would somehow limit or that it would uh, limit uh, the, the signal significantly. But actually, this turned out to be not such a big problem. It, it works. Uh, it works very good, uh, the propagation here. We, uh, we arrived early, and we did a bunch of testing while we were waiting for the network operation center to, uh, to get the network up and running. I, I don't know if... Uh, you know already, but uh, actually the NOC has replaced pretty much all the network infrastructure in, in the building for, for uh, the Congress network to, to make it powerful enough and, and good enough for, uh, for what we need to do. And uh, um, this, of course, takes some time. It's, it's a big building. So, um, yeah, we were a bit blocked by that, but um, in the end it, it worked out well. I, uh, I tried to take some, some photos while, while we were doing this uh, that I'd, I'd like to show. Here's a, a stack of SIM cards. As I mentioned, programming SIM cards is, is, is part of the fun. Uh, it's, it's a bit repetitive, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty quick, so it's not so bad. We've automated and written some scripts there available uh, in the PySIM repository if you want to uh, have a look. I don't know if you can see this. This is one, uh, one table of gear in our room. Here's the, uh, uh, the BTS on the ground floor. Maybe you've seen it. How many have seen it already? No, all right, about, about 30%, very good. Here's some, uh, some testing we were doing inside the room. Uh, we, we needed to mount Antennas, of course, and we uh, mounted antennas in a in a few really good places, really good locations. Uh, we were able to find some good locations, but we didn't bring uh, maybe all the mounting hardware that we actually needed. So uh, then we had to improvise a bit. Uh, we had some SIM cards left over. Well, the plastic around the actual mini SIM uh, left over. So we made some. Uh, some washers with that, and uh, sometimes you need to, to transport a ladder and it doesn't fit in the elevator, so try the next elevator, and uh, because it's a big ladder, that's how it goes. Finally, we were able to use the SIM card uh, uh, plastic pieces here to, to fit the antenna into this, uh, this um, rail in the ceiling. That worked out well. Here's the, the antenna on, uh, on the fridge over, over at the bar. Yeah, more SIM cards. Can you read this, actually? Uh, OK. Uh, no, maybe not. This is the, the test license, anyway, that we have. Uh, it says uh, 1780 to 1784 and uh, 0.4 and 1875.8 to 1879.4 megahertz, which we are allowed to use, uh, issued on the 10th of December. Uh, more workspace, 
this is, uh, uh, it's gotten even even more uh, crowded and uh, uh, well crowded more crowded than this is, is pretty easy actually because there are no people there but it's uh, gotten more full and we have more uh, even more papers on the walls and and so I want to keep track on of what exactly is going on uh, I, I'd like to talk a bit about fun use cases so we had some some remarkable uh, remarkable use cases that I uh, I really really liked. This is um, this is a laptop. I don't know if you can see what it says on the screen. It says root at Fika MX and Python SMS dot pi uh, 9899 at some timestamp uh, was sending an SMS with the contents exclamation point curl. So 9899 that's my extension. We uh, uh, we found this uh, this machine running on the network and receiving SMSs uh, uh, with interesting contents and sending back SMSs also with interesting contents. It turned out that someone had set up a, um, a root shell via, SS, uh, via SMS service on this laptop. <laughs> so. I sent it my public SSH key, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, actually that that worked out. So I was able to log into the laptop afterwards. <laughs> uh, we had some some testing equipment in uh, in the room. We uh, made some load tests. This is a, a box with 16 GSM modems. Uh, we used it to uh, yes, as I said, load test the the network, and uh, we were able to find at least one bug that that uh, got fixed. So that's good. I promised some statistics as well. Uh, numbers on the left. Let's see. So the timeline is uh, clock, Central European time, local time. Uh, the big spike there uh, just before. So here in the evening of the uh, 22nd, uh, sorry, 27th of day one, is a, a bug in the statistics script. So that is that's that's an anomaly. I, we didn't clear it out. We could have, but I thought it was nicer to to leave it in to short, sort of uh, really show the show that we also had some bit of chaos, even though. Uh, things worked pretty well. Uh, there are some sections of, of flat, uh, just just flat uh, here. No change in in the numbers, no activity at all. Uh, those are the the two periods where uh, where we also tested tested OpenBTS. And uh, one thing that is is particularly um, fantastic about this uh, this network or these networks is that we, for a very brief time, we were able to run both networks at the same time. That hasn't been done before. It uh, um, in the middle between them, we have uh, we're using the software LCR Linux call router. Uh, which by now uh, knows how to speak natively with OpenBSC and it also knows how to speak SIP. So one of the common use cases and something that I've, I've used it for before or uh, yeah, yes, one time is to have OpenBSC with a SIP connect to a SIP network. So uh, somehow similar to how OpenBTS works but using OpenBSC instead and um, that, that worked. Uh, here we were able to make it also talk to OpenBTS at the same time. So if you would call a GSM number, it would try to ring in both networks. And of course, uh, a given phone was only ever in one network. So uh, then it would ring, of course, because it was uh, being called in both networks. But uh, the other network would, would just know that this is uh, the subscriber is not available and and uh, close, uh, cancel the ringing. But thanks to thanks to LCR, this this works. I I think that's uh, I'm I'm really really happy about that. So I wanted wanted to mention it. I think it's a, a pretty cool um, combination of the two projects. 
So I want to say some, some personal thanks as well to Harald Welte and Holger Freiter at Sysmocom. Uh, Harald, unfortunately, didn't make it, uh, didn't, uh, wasn't, isn't here for 2093. He's still in Berlin. Uh, Holger is here and has been helping out uh, really great. And, and all their preparation in advance has, has, is really what has allowed us to set up this network uh, at all. Uh, I also want to, to say a very, very special thanks to the heroes and the, the heroines of the NOC. They were uh, working really, really hard to set everything up, and uh, I was kind of a pain uh, running over there and asking for uh, extra changes. Uh, I did some, some requests in advance, but hmm, uh, everything changed once we, once we got on site. Of course, the OpenBSC community, uh, as always, and the OpenBTS community uh, for, for working on these, these softwares. It's, um, it's fantastic what, we've, what we're able to do with them. I want to say a special thanks to, to Nico and Kevin, who, uh, who made the lovely graphics. And also thanks to uh, Eventphone and, and the POC for uh, helping us connect to the de DEC network. Because as you might have noticed, uh, I don't know if Peter asked about it, uh, it's possible to also call between the DEC and the GSM network in both directions. And uh, that uh, reminds me of a, another really nice use case. We, uh, at some point, I think day one or possibly day two, we had made some modification to the code and uh, we, uh, we wanted to restart OpenBSC. But so when we do that, we will also, of course, uh, close all active calls. And we saw that there was one really long running phone call. Uh, we didn't really want to just abort this, uh, just uh, uh, stop this call. So we started looking uh, at uh, where, first of all, where the person was, what, uh, what BTS it was connected to, the phone, and the number that it was calling. And it turned out that it was someone sitting here in, in Saal 1 and uh, was making a very long phone call to the translation service over GSM. So we, uh, we, of course, waited until the presentation was over, and, and then we uh, restarted. So in conclusion, running a, a GSM network can be, uh, can be pretty easy, uh, even if you're at home. The, the, the BTS hardware that we've been using the, uh, here is, is a bit expensive for, for hobby, hobbyist use, but uh, we've, uh, I've talked to several people at, for example, a hackerspace who are interested in, in uh, pooling some money and, and buying one of these base stations in order to set up um, a, a test network at their hackerspace. I think that's a fantastic idea to, to try this out. Make sure to get the license. So check what the rules are in your country. In, in Germany, it's, it's pretty easy. I saw that in, in Sweden, it's, uh, it seems also pretty easy. The, the PTS, uh, the government authority in, in Sweden responsible for uh, radio spectrum, they also they have a, a, a good procedure and a really good, uh, really good documentation for how to apply for these test licenses, and it doesn't it doesn't seem like a big deal at all. It's worth mentioning also that the the GSM uh, 1800 megahertz band. So watch out with that if you're if you want to get started with this and you want to uh, uh, you're in the market for some some kind of equipment. Uh, check that the especially if you're buying used equipment. Check that it actually fits the area where you are, the geographical area, because throughout the world, GSM uses a bit different frequencies. And in Germany, for example, we have 900 and 1800 megahertz, where the 900 megahertz band is completely full. There are no available frequencies anymore. It's, it's all used by commercial operators. So the only uh, part of the, the frequency spectrum that is um, available for test licenses is the 1800 megahertz band. And 
Uh, sometimes it's possible to find BTS units that uh, have been uh, have been used or being sold used that come from the US and maybe they come at a good price but uh, pay attention because in the US they use a 1900 megahertz frequency band instead and and that unit won't really work in the 18 megahertz band so make sure to get the right hardware and make sure to get a license uh, the configuration files are incredibly actually simple. There, are, there is a nano BTS example in the OpenBSC source. Uh, the LCR configuration files are, are short and sweet. Um, we, uh, I will make sure to upload those uh, or give them to anyone who's interested. Come talk to us. Um, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's what I have. Uh, in closing, here's uh, a tag cloud. Oh. Oh, well, sort of centered uh, a tag cloud from the SMS messages that you've been sending. Happy hacking. Thank you, Peter. Um, we will take any questions at microphones one, two, three, and four, so please line up there. And we have a bunch of questions from IRC, I see. We have two. So let's start with IRC. Do you have a microphone? Okay, so um, first question is, uh, how much does a license cost in Germany and what happens if you don't get one? So. I mentioned uh, uh, the costs that I've seen is about 200, on the order of 200 euros for the first year. And if you want to uh, renew the license in Germany, you, you pay a much smaller fee. So I've, I've, uh, I haven't seen the, the, um, the invoice myself, but I've, I've been told that it's about 35 euros per year for, for renewing a license that you already have. So it's, um, it's affordable. The, uh, um, what happens if you don't have a license? Well, you can't run the network. It's that simple. But will they notice? It's, it's the question, do they come here with vans and uh, yeah, with an antenna on top? And <laughs> I've, I've heard about uh, accidents happening where, uh, honest accidents, where someone had automated a, a BTS running uh, at their home. And after, a, uh, but so they had tested it. They were working with this at uh, at the university. Uh, they had replicated a setup at home, or they had brought the setup home to work on it there. Uh, it was configured to boot up automatically after. Uh, well, yes, boot up automatically. And after a power outage, the system started on its own when this person wasn't at home. And as the person arrived at home, they were greeted by uh, uh, the Bundesnetzagentur who were standing in front of the door <laughs> and, and with a measurement device and saying, here, there's a, a thing here. What is this? <laughs> so uh, it's very, very simple. Uh, okay, if you don't have the license, you can't run the network. And also very expensive. Uh, the, the cost for those people who then come by and analyze uh, it can be easily several thousand euros. I'm, I'm sure it can be way more also, yes. Okay, um, next question from microphone number one. Uh, what's about uh, DTMF? On, uh, on Friday I was able to, to deliver some uh, DTMF tones to my uh, cold party, but it works uh, quite fine. And on Saturday, I mean yesterday, I wasn't absolutely unable, and I observed that uh, some of my tones were uh, doubled. So what, what, what is the state? As I mentioned, there were two different networks running at different times, so probably the DTMF worked in, in one of the networks and the other, uh, and not in the other. And depending on exactly what time you made the tests, I, we, yeah, we would have to check in the log files, maybe. Um, stop by the room and, and let's find out exactly. But just uh, for education, mm -hmm. when it doesn't work, what, what, what's the, what is the problem? Well, quite likely there's a, a, a codec problem. So somewhere along the line of uh, the audio that is being transmitted, there is a, a codec, a, a software that is changing the way the audio is, is digitized into a different format. And 
DTMF is, is some kind of signaling. It's a very simple signaling on top of an audio stream. If the codec, codec is, uh, is aggressive or is compressing hard enough, then it, it might uh, actually destroy the DTMF signaling. So, so the, it's, it's, I think it's likely a codec issue. Thank you. Number two. Uh, could we uh, could we have another look at the graphics, the representation of the of the usage uh, of the network? Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on uh, in the beginning there is uh, there are for qu several hours no active users at all, while all the uh, SMSs and uh, the the uh, the uh, the light blue line uh, between. Uh, between zero and twelve, there is uh, there seem to be uh, no uh, no active subscribers, uh, while there are happily uh, all sorts of calls and, and SMSs. Uh. Well, a small number of subscribers can can make many calls and send many SMSs. Uh, yeah, keep in, I, keep I, I, I even would have attributed that uh, to uh, to another yet another another glitch in uh, in, the, in the charting software. But uh, I, I noticed at some point in time that uh, I, when I tried to activate my mobile, that it uh, it didn't work over over several hours. So I think there there might be uh, might be something to it in this case. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's possible, especially we were so on day one, uh, the first 24 hours, we were still doing setup around the building. So, yeah, so that's, it's absolutely possible that there was very little activity. And uh, up until this, uh, this, this glitch here, the, the statistics may not be 100% reliable. I think they are good, but, but it's possible that there were, uh, were uh, bugs there that weren't fixed until after this big glitch. Microphone number three. Uh, I'd like to thank you first for setting up and running this awesome network and for producing this great software. I <laughs> Yes, thank you. Well, don't, don't, it's not me. I, <laughs> I help set it up. Anyways. But the, the communities of these, these projects are, uh, yes, are quite amazing. I was wondering if you're planning to build a 3G or 4G software in the future, and if yes, how can I contribute? I know that there has been some work on, on 3G. Uh, I, I know that it's significantly harder than the 2G, the legacy GSM. Um, I guess it's a matter of, of time, uh, how much time people can spend on, on working on this. And if, uh, if there's, uh, some, yeah, and motivation, of course. So how can you contribute? I suggest to join the mailing lists and, and come talk to us in the room, of course, also. Uh, we are still here for all of today, and, and maybe someone will even be here tomorrow um, and, and see, see what, what you can do. LTE, so personally, this is just speculation, but, but personally, I think that maybe uh, UMTS will, uh, will not get so much attention and that focus will instead be on LTE to, to sort of make, the, make a leap instead of, of going over UMTS because there's so much effort involved that, uh, in, in doing both of those or doing either of those that when, since there is a new standard, maybe it makes more sense to go straight for the, uh, for the LTE. But let's see what happens. In the end, it comes down to, to who, who contributes and, and uh, who has an interest in, in doing either of, of these. OK, thank you. Next question from uh, the internet. Okay, um, question Can we get the microphone off the signal? Yeah. Uh, question was uh, if handover works between the OpenBSC and OpenBTS networks. Oh, so uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, interesting, interesting question. Good question. Handover has been tested uh, in the uh, two networks separately, but uh, there is no handover between the two networks. 
So we were, we were just barely able to make a call between the two. We don't have a bridge for SIP, uh, sorry, for SMS. Uh, so uh, no, no handover at, at this time. Uh, I think that would be fantastic, fantastic of course, but, but uh, no. There was some handover testing done in, in the separate, in the two networks separately, but, but not between the networks. Microphone number four. Yeah, hi, uh, Peter. I'd like to know, um, if possible, a, a few things. Um, one, I'd, I'd like to know what hardware is installed in the different five floors where you mentioned the different things specifically and what kind of power output uh, is going on there. Um, I'd also like to know uh, if there's some statistics. Uh, the statistics are very positive, and that's great and all. Um, personally, I, I didn't use the phone as much as I thought I might, but the two times I did actually try to use the phone, it didn't work. Oh. Um, which was kind of unfortunate, and, but I've had lots of experience with this. I know what's going on. But I'd like—I wonder—are there any statistics that are more kind of negative? You know, how many calls were dropped? How many SMS has failed? Do you have anything on when handover worked? Or, or I don't really sure if handover is an issue in OpenBSC with the hardware that you're using. If it just works, or if it works sometimes and sometimes not, because it's quite experimental in OpenBTS. I know. Mm. Um, so I'd like to know also some of the results from the load testing um, tests. These may be things that I can meet with the GSM people later and get this specific information. It's quite a lot to ask for in this session. Um, but there's those those things, and uh, also just another another comment. I found one fixed phone down by the door, um, and I thought it, that uh, I didn't see them around, or I didn't really find much information very easily on where people could access fixed phones in order to be able to call uh, GSM phones. Because I did also mention to a couple of people, oh, you can call me on my GSM, and they said I don't have a phone. So, um, you know, I think that would be something that would be really good at these events if there were a lot of fixed phones around, you know? It's quite, it's a pretty easy thing to do, I think. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I will try to answer uh, as best as I can. We have nano BTS hardware uh, running IP access uh, on, on the floors. And um, uh, so we have three watts of, of output power in the. Uh, we are allowed to use three watts of output power in the license. We're not using that, all of that. Um, the other question was negative results. We uh, we have plenty of log files, but we didn't look for negative results yet. <laughs> uh, it's a good idea. I think we should. Uh, as for dropped SMSs, um, me and, and another guy in Berlin, Tobias, uh, we, we want to work on an SMSC that can be shared. We are working on an SMSC that can be shared also in both OpenBTS and OpenBSC. We, it's not finished uh, to a point where we could actually use it this time uh, here. We would have liked to, but mm, still work to do. Once uh, once we have that working, I uh, I, I think I. So here's the thing: SMS is is a little bit uh, shaky in both OpenBSC and OpenBTS. In in my experience, it does work. It, it's not that things get randomly dropped, but. Uh, so it, it, it could be better, and we hope that we can uh, make a, a leap in, um, in performance with the SMSC software. So uh, there wasn't much focus on, because the, the development effort for this SMSC is ongoing, there wasn't much focus on, on quality of service for, for SMS. We, I mean, we saw things like the root shell working, so, so and, and the, the tag cloud, uh, and we have what here submitted SMS 6000 something. So it's not that it doesn't work. It works really, uh, it, it really works. But um, we hope to get even more uh, performance, a, a big leap in performance with a, a new SMSC software. Um, so yeah, no, not much focus on that. Uh, third question. Uh, I asked about load testing. Load okay. testing, exactly. Results. Yes, uh, please, please, uh, please come over to the room and uh, talk to the respective people who, who did the actual testing. Uh, they will be able to get you the exact results. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Number three. Um, 
You didn't actually, you didn't let any data calls through, did you? Because I was trying to um, call a BBS so I could perhaps set up my own, but uh, you didn't support that yet, right? That's that's correct. So we have uh, we have attempted to we have tried GPRS. Uh, uh, I don't know by if by data call you mean. Uh, I mean pure GSM data call. Circuit switch data. Like yeah, yes. like on a normal phone network. Yes, so uh, there is some code for that in OpenBSC. Uh, we, I'm not sure that it works with the Nano BTS. I'm not sure that the Nano BTS can do it at all. I don't think it can. Um, so yeah, no, that was not that was not possible to do here. Um, I, data you mentioned, so I'll I'll also go on a tangent about GPRS. Previously, we've done some testing with GPRS, but we found out that actually the Nano BTS uh, firmware is uh, not so good at handling GPRS. So the, the Nano BTS tends to crash whenever we enable GPRS. It's, it's fine if we don't load it very much, but uh, so for testing in the lab, for example, it, it works. Or for making some proof of concept, uh, uh, proof of concept testing, uh, that's fine. But for for a, an actual test network with um, some hundreds of users, we had uh, uh, we brought 500 SIM cards. They were sold out in the first couple of days. And I think just in the first two days. Uh, that that kind of load, if uh, putting all those SIM cards into smartphones, the smartphones will try to do lots of data traffic. Uh, over GPRS and the whole network would just stop working because the the, um, the BTSs will be overloaded from the GPRS traffic. So uh, we we decided not to have that uh, have that enabled. Okay, thank you. Yep. Next question for microphone number two. Uh, hello, I have two questions. One is, uh, did you check the range uh, that the network worked out? You said through it worked on the train station, but did any other checks were made? Uh, outside the train station. We, 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 the testing we did was inside the building, mm -hmm. so we wanted to ensure that, that the, the indoor, area of, uh, indoor areas of the building were, were covered, and we noticed that from, uh, from one corner to another of the building, the, well, so in the, the far ends of the building, on both sides, the signal was uh, somehow spotty with the original plan of deployment or, or, or site uh, cell sites that we had in mind. So, um, so we we modified slightly as as time went on, and we made the last uh, the last changes actually last night to to move things around and to get even better coverage indoors. So um, we, we, as I mentioned, uh, we have moderate to good coverage in all indoor areas. And uh, the fact that it goes to Damtor is, is probably one of the uh, base stations that happens to be near uh, the window uh, that actually uh, also reaches out to. Uh, uh, and uh, your answer brings me nicely to the second question I have. Uh, what was the procedure for initial testing for planning the placement of the uh, base stations? So we did that dry, actually. We looked at the, uh, the drawings of the building and, and based on experience from how the Nano BTS performed in the BCC in Berlin, we, we sort of estimated how what kind of coverage we would we would get? As I mentioned, we were uh, fairly worried about the walls, especially in this room. But it turned out to be not a problem at all. Um, so um, not so scientific. We there as a, uh, there is some software for modeling GSM networks or radio propagation in general, uh, which we didn't use. Um, none of us have access to that, or uh, yeah, none of the, the people who were preparing have access to that. Um, and even so, uh, to, it's not completely accurate. So it's it's a it's a rather rough estimate, especially in an indoor environment. We we opted for bringing extra equipment and uh, being able to react to any problems that we found when we uh, during setup. And so and yeah. So just place the equipment and then run around with a phone seeing if it has range? Uh, pretty much, yes. <laughs> it's not so scientific, but, but it yes, works. it works. 
And of course, as we try this in different locations, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the CCC camp is the, was at the Finufort Luftfahrtmuseum, uh, a little bit outside Berlin, um, an old airport, which is a museum now with uh, bunkers for the airplanes. Uh, we, were, uh, we, we got some experience with outdoor environment and uh, in the desert where I was helping out, I also uh, got some experience with outdoor environment where uh, there were a lot of um, uh, caravans and mobile homes which function similar to buildings um, in, in, say, a street or an, an urban environment. Uh, they have metal walls and those metal walls reflect the radio signal really well. So it was completely possible to have an excellent signal just standing in front of the, uh, someone's trailer and then you move two meters to the left and suddenly you had no signal at all. Uh, that's that's a kind of difficult. That's kind of difficult to deal with. You have to set up many more base stations, and then you need many more frequencies. And um, we are only so many people. That's also uh, also a, a limiting factor. The the people who can come and, and help uh, help set this up in in just a few days, especially uh, around the holidays, is can be tricky. So. Uh, yeah, we we did a um, maybe a, a relatively small scale setup, but um, we of course try to improve every time, and every time we do it, we learn even more about uh, the the things that we have to keep in mind and what doesn't work. Most of all, so um, I I really encourage anyone who wants to try this out to. Uh, to look into getting the license and, and uh, working together with some friends to get some hardware and, and set, it up, set up a network nearby and, and play around. Thank you. Do we have a question from the blogosphere? Yeah, one. Um, did anyone try to hack or exploit the network in any way while we're, you were running it? We're really disappointed to say no. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Or at least not that we know of. Um, but yes, we were sort of hoping that someone would, would try to attack the network. But um, no, no attacks that we've seen. Number one. Hey, um, I have two questions. One is, what is the difference between a test net license and a regular license? Good question. I haven't I haven't gotten a regular license. So there are uh, in the test license that we have, we uh, it's stated clearly that we are not allowed to connect to the public phone network, which we haven't done. Um, that's that's I imagine the the big uh, the big difference. So for the test network, we run for a closed user group. We have only the people attending the congress with the, the SIM cards. Uh, whereas if you have a commercial network license, I, I imagine that you are allowed to sell services to the general public. Well, uh, the connections between the regular GSM network actually run, run quite fine, thanks to the POC guys. Oh, uh, so that has to be a, a misconfiguration then. <laughs> <laughs> and the other question is about the base stations. Um, I haven't, haven't had much experience with base stations, so what, what does I run your software? Does, do, do you have modified anything and, and what protocol does it speak on the non-UM interface? So the Nano BTS uh, is not running our software. It is being controlled by our software, OpenBSC. The communication between the, uh, our server running OpenBSC and the Nano BTS uh, uh, units that have been deployed uh, is over TCP IP. It's uh, an OML. Um, the, the protocol, communication protocol, is, is OML, and the link is called ABIS. Um. We have time for the last three questions. One from number four. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to answer a previous question about DTMF. Uh, in, in their infinite wisdom, the IETF has defined multiple ways to transfer DTMF information over SIP and RTP. And they're also, in my experience with OpenBTS on Asterisk, FreeSwitch, and Yate, these are also supported inconsistently across different switching products. And what this means is that it's very easy to make configuration errors that cause very strange DTMF behavior. 
So if you saw multiple DTMF events, it probably meant that somebody had, had successfully enabled multiple DTMF modes simultaneously in the switch, and they were all working at the same time. So. Thanks. Nice. Number three. Yeah, regarding that shell via SMS, feel free to try it out, uh, 9564. It's not running at, as root anymore. Uh, it's <laughs> in a change root now and running at another user. Uh, it's a bit flaky, but feel free to try it out. It's lots of fun. Thanks for setting that up. <laughs> and again, number three. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I've seen multiple networks. One was 2093 and the other one was Fairwaves. Um, I guess the one was uh, OpenBSC and the other one was OpenBTS. Uh, so the, the network where SIM cards could be used was always uh, um, mobile country code 262, mobile network code 42. And that's also the number, uh, the MNC, MCC and MNC on the SIM card. Uh, we, uh, in the test license, and possibly, I don't know what it is like for the non-test license, but in the test license, there is no uh, statement about what MNC uh, one is supposed to use for this, uh, for this radio uh, system. Um, we, we started using 26242 some time ago, and we continue using that for, for the actual uh, network that, is, um, that, that people can access. Uh, but we've also been doing some testing uh, separately from that using uh, frequencies that weren't being used for, uh, for the network running uh, for, the, for the visitors. And probably those are the networks that you saw Okay. In, in parallel, uh, I, you might have been able to log on, you might not have been. Uh, they were used with the separate SIM cards, I know, at times. Okay, a uh, related question. Is it possible to use existing SIM cards from uh, commercial operators on these networks? In theory, yes, if we would allow it, but then we are interfering with the services that the commercial networks provide. So we don't want to do that. Uh, because if, uh, the, as many of you may know, if the phone sees a, uh, a very strong signal, it, is, it tends to go there. Um, and if we would allow, uh, well, actually, as long as it sees its home network, it won't go there. But uh, say that you are you're walking around a corner and uh, there's a, a slightly bad coverage of your normal uh, SIM card um, uh, of your normal operator, then your phone will immediately jump over to the test network and you, it won't necessarily go back because it's happy where it is uh, in, in roaming um, as the phone thinks that it is. So we, we don't want to interfere with the public, uh, with the public networks and thus we also don't accept anything but the, the SIM cards from here. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Peter and the GSM group. Put your hands together, please. <laughs>